We're on page six, obedience and leadership. What's that? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Obedience and leadership. Um, so we've... They may want to share like a, an insight from your last discussion that you thought was powerful. Anybody? I guess one of the things I was... <laughs> it's, it doesn't, you know, the more you serve it, the, the worse it gets. So it's like, you know, why do I want to serve such a cruel master when Jesus is such a such a good master, such a kind master? The eye is never satisfied. Were you saying something, Janet? Oh. You had to look like you had something really <laughs> Okay. Well, when we talk about obedience and leadership, um, Let's read here in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Paul, Paul writes this. He said, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And that's, that's a pretty... Um, what was the word I want? It's a, it puts a lot of pressure upon people to think about this because you're saying, you're saying, okay, I want to follow Christ in such a way that others can follow my example. And this is not really a pride thing with Paul. He's not saying this out of pride. He's saying, I'm really pursuing Christ, and you can look at my life and, in a way, model yourself after that. So part of, part of what happens as a leader is that people will look up to you regardless. You're either going to be a good leader or a bad one, but people will, people will look up to you. Your life will become an example and people will follow you at some level. Now I know we're all supposed to follow Christ, but we do. Like we read earlier, I think you know Jerry mentioned it from the Proverbs that that we if we're hanging around a wise person we'll be wise. If we hang around a foolish person we'll be foolish. It's like we do rub off on one another. And so it's important for us to realize that you know part of and it's not really my motivation to be obedient but it's kind of one of the byproducts. My motivation to be obedient is I love Jesus. But how many of you know that my obedience is going to affect my children? And my obedience is going to affect my wife or my husband. And my obedience is going to affect other Christians that know me and that hang around with me. And I can either be a positive uh, influence or a role model, or I can be a negative one, but people will pick up from me. And so Paul's saying, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And I hope that what we can do as people is to be able to look at a person, like if I'm, like if I'm following your example, Dave, I can look at the things in your life that are of Christ and pick up on that, and I can, maybe I can see something that's maybe not of Christ and, and not take that on, you know. Because we can, we can almost get this idea of... Uh, the person we're following in the Lord is without flaw, and we're all flawed people. You know, so it's, what is it of Christ we see in each other's lives? And let that be something we follow after, and we bring correction and change to those areas that aren't of Christ, but we're really helping each other follow him so that we can, we can model one another. You get a brand new Christian that comes in to the Lord, I'll tell you, there, there, are, there are so many things in the world today that, ravage a person's life when, when when someone comes into christ and they've been in the world for 20 or 30 years they're many not not always but many times their life is just really messed up and they need to be learning about the things of the lord and being taught the things of the lord but one of the ways they can learn is through your life as they're around you they can see well how do you handle your conflicts you know how do you handle your finances how do you deal in your marriage how do you train your children and these are things as we walk in obedience to christ that can actually have a very positive outcome in the lives of people that we're trying to minister to 
And we're trying to take people who have been walking in disobedience to the Lord for, for all their life, and we're bringing them into the kingdom of God, and we're saying there's a new path, a new way, a new life that Christ has for you, and it's a life of obedience, and you can in some way see that operating now in our life. I mean, you're not telling them this, but hopefully it's being picked up. And so there's like a, an added burden upon leadership to really pursue obedience because you know your life is affecting other people. Always does. And uh, that's why integrity is important because we're not trying to be one thing here and something different at home. You know, we're not, we're not like, well, I'll act like a Christian when I'm around the Christian people, but as soon as there's no Christians around, I'm going to be this other person. It's not that. We are people of integrity. We are who we say we are here and there because it's Christ in us. And so the notes should say we are called to, to obey and to urge others to follow our example. And I had a kind of a side note there that our disobedience can cause others to disobey. You remember the story of the ten spies? There were twelve spies. Two of them believed that they should obey God and go into the wilderness or into the promised land. Ten of them didn't think they could do it. There were too many giants. And their disobedience to God influenced the entire congregation of the children of Israel. They spent 40 years in the wilderness because of the example of ten men. That's pretty, pretty profound when you think about that. that those ten little guys, because of their disobedience, influenced thousands of people to die in the wilderness, to never really enter into the promise, the promised land that God had planned for them. Uh, next, we are called to teach others to obey. Now, when you, as you grow in the Lord and you step into places of leadership, Remember that what we're, really, what we're really doing is we are leading people to obedience. That's really, in, a, in the simplest way I can say it, we're helping people to walk in obedience to the Lord. And I know sometimes we feel um, unequipped for that task. It's kind of like, well, who am I to teach a person to obey when, when you know your own struggles? You know, or who am I to be that person to take that role in their life? But yet the scripture calls us to this. You know, it says in Matthew 28 that what we call the Great Commission, part of the Great Commission is in verse 20, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. I mean, we are to go into all the world and make disciples and we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then he says part of that is teaching them to obey. And so as, as a person comes to Christ and they're becoming now a disciple, we're saying, hey, you know, I want, to have a, I want to have a role in your life. And part of that role is I want to help you walk in obedience to Christ. And, and again, maybe you're not using those words, but by the things you talk to them about, by sharing the scripture with them, by being an example, you know, you're helping to bring that person around to obedience. To see that change in their life. And you're, you're really helping them to be connected to Jesus himself so that their love for him and their relationship with him also uh, spawns that heart of obedience as well. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So it's kind of like we're, as we work with people, help them to fall in love with Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about their relationship. Encourage them to get to know the Lord. I mean, maybe firm up the fact that are they really saved? Are they really surrendered to him? Because you're getting the Lord's help at that point. Because now they're surrendered to him. Now they love him. Now they're walking or desiring to grow in obedience to him because their relationship to the Lord is intact. But then beyond that, you know, we're always encouraging and helping. You know, we're counseling. Uh, sometimes we're correcting. Sometimes we're comforting. But I'll tell you, more often than not, what you're doing is you're trying to help understand where is the disobedience in this person's life and how can I help move it toward obedience? You know, if you have a friend, we talked earlier about the gossip. If you have a friend who's always calling you and gossiping, move them toward obedience. 
You know, you do that by saying, you know what? You know, I, I understand that you have this issue, but let me, let me share with you what the Word of God says. You know, it says if we have an issue with another person, we should go to them one-on-one. And the Bible says we should also, we should not gossip because we're, you know, we are destroying friendships. And I said, I know that's not what your heart is. Your heart is not to destroy a friendship. So I'm encouraging you to do what the Scripture says here. Go to that person yourself, and let's pray right now. Let's pray that God will give you the grace to call them or meet with them and discuss this issue and have it dealt with. And see, so what you've done there is you've taken an incident where a person is walking in disobedience and you've brought the word of God to bear in the situation in a kind way, but you corrected them. And you, 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 know, you called them to a place of obedience. Now, they, they've got to walk in it, but, but you've called them to obedience. You see how that happens? And, and you take that example, and you can apply it to many, many areas. I mean, you have a guy that's, uh, let's, let's say you run into a person who never keeps a job. He, he has a job, he works two weeks, he's gone. Another week, he gets fired. He goes here, he gets fired. Why is this guy always getting fired from his job? Well, you might sit down and find out and say, hey, you know, you, you had a job two weeks ago, you got fired, then you got fired. And every time I talk to you, you tell me, my, it's my boss, it's my this, my this. Well, the common denominator here is, is you. <laughs> What's going on, you know? And you talk to this person, and maybe there's an issue with their work ethic. Maybe they're not really working as unto the Lord. You know what I mean? And, and so you can help take a situation that's really affecting their life. I mean, the guy's not able to pay his bills because, he, because his attitude at work stinks. And now his family's suffering. You know, now they're going hungry. They're getting their electric shut off. And it's not because... Somebody doesn't want to hire him because his attitude stinks at work. So you sit down and you, and you can say, hey, look, here's what the Word of God says. And you need to honor your boss and work as unto the Lord. And so you're starting to take some scriptural principles that you know. And you're, you're teaching this person to obey. And again, it's not, it's not saying that I'm better than you. It's just you're, you're taking an understanding and a principle of obedience that you've maybe learned or walked in. And you're helping a brother or sister in the Lord to move toward obedience. And you know it's going to bless their life. If that person can come to the place where their attitude changes and they can go and be consistent on a job, it'll be a blessing to his family. You know, so those are the things we deal with all the time. And, and you know the stories. You, he, there's people all around us you know, that come into the Lord and their, their lives have been just ravaged by Satan. And part of our task is to help move them toward obedience. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And so as we're working with people and loving people and you know, bringing them into our lives, we're going to start finding out as they share with us, hey, there's, here's some issues here to work with, and how can I help move them toward a place of greater obedience to Christ? And that's really, that is the work of the ministry. That's what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day. And this is what Jesus called us to do. This is, this is the Great Commission. You know, evangelism is only the beginning of it. It is teaching them to obey everything he's commanded as the ongoing part of that Great Commission. Romans fifteen eighteen, Paul says, I will, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. You know, Paul saw that part of his task as an apostle to the Gentiles, was to make them obedient. You see that? And again, this is not pride. This is not like I'm better than you. I've got it together and you don't. It's none of that. It is together we are helping each other move toward obedience, to obey the Lord. And as a leader, as a person who's moving in toward leadership in the kingdom of God, you know, that burden falls upon us to say, okay, now I have a responsibility. God has brought people into my sphere of, of relationship and influence, you know, can I help nudge them on toward obedience? You can't walk their walk for them, but you can at least speak the truth and teach them and urge them and counsel them and try to move them toward obedience. But that's part of, part of the task of, of leadership is to take a person and help make them obedient. Uh, Romans 1.5 uh, he talks about that he had received the grace and apostleship for what? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. 
And initially, this obviously is obedience to Christ, following him in, in, in salvation, but it's, it's following through with the Great Commission as well. We've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. And so when we're talking with people to come to, come to know Christ, remember, we are talking about being a follower, of walking in obedience to Jesus. Galatians 5, 7 he says, uh, he writes to the Galatian church, you did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You see, he was again talking about obedience here, obeying the truth. Somehow they had heard a false doctrine, they began to go off the path. What does Paul do in that situation? He brings them back to obedience. He, he, he confronts it and says, hey, why aren't you guys obeying the truth anymore? What's going on? And there are times like that in our lives where we need to have that same kind of a conversation with people. What's happening? Why are you walking in disobedience? Why have you moved into a place of disobedience? Come back to the things of the Lord. Um, in Hebrews thirteen seventeen, we'll read the next scripture. Now, uh, here's the notes. In persuading others, and that's really what we're doing, in persuading others, we must be humble, vigilant, and accountable. And I'll talk about that. We must be humble, vigilant, and accountable. And this is a message, actually. This scripture is written to the flock. And he says, obey your leaders. And that word obey is a word that means to be persuaded. Be persuaded by. So you, I, I guess the point I'm making with that is that the Lord is not setting up some kind of a dictatorial type of a relationship here. He says, you have leaders, and they should be leaders of character. So there should be an ability to trust them in that sense. But there's also this idea of bringing persuasion. Part of, part of our role as leaders in the body of Christ is to persuade people. You know, and it's not like, we're not using like uh, salesman tactics. We're persuading by love by our care by the word of god by the holy spirit we are persuading you to walk in obedience to christ and it's up to the people the flock to be in a heart of of being willing to be persuaded you know let's sit down and reason together look at the word of god and, and let's let's see if we can persuade you or if you can be persuaded to stop gossiping can we persuade you to go forgive that brother? Can we persuade you to start disciplining your children the way they should? Can I persuade you to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Can I persuade you to be a man of character? Can I persuade you? You know what I'm saying? So we're, we're taking all these principles that we understand as obedience to Christ. And, and my role, your role as raising up in leaders is to say, how can I persuade people? And, and, and like I said at the very beginning of this class... One of our greatest abilities to persuade people is by building a relationship where they know we genuinely care. You know, if I sat down with somebody that had a relationship with me and I was able to, I was able to talk with them about persuading them into a direction of change in their life, you know, maybe, maybe an area of disobedience they're walking in, I'll probably have a greater success with a person that I have a relationship with than if I just walk over to somebody I don't even know and have the same conversation. So that's why relationship is that bridge that helps us to have an influence. And so it says there, obey your leaders and to submit to them. The, the Bible calls the flock to have a submitted heart. This means that to, to me, that as a leader, we need to be humble. You know, when a person, like in a husband and wife situation, for example, when a wife is called to submit to her husband, doesn't mean the husband takes advantage of that. He's got to be a servant leader. He's got to have a heart of humility because here's a human being who's coming and saying, I'm going to be submitted to you. You know, I'm going to look to you for some leadership in my life. Our children do that to us as parents, moms and dads. And in the church, there's this relationship with the flock. And it's the same thing. He's, he's telling the flock here to obey your leaders and to submit to them. So there's a, a responsibility that's given to the people of God. But that, to me, means there's a responsibility for, for the leaders 
as well. We should never take advantage of that. We should never uh, leverage those hearts of people to get an advantage. I mean, our heart is always to say, Lord, I want to be humble and I want to help these people grow in their relationship to you and help move them toward obedience. That's, that's the whole purpose of, of this relationship, of obedience and submission, is to help one another grow in our walk with the Lord. I think sometimes it is taken advantage of, and you've got to be careful, especially when someone comes and says, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm submitted to this local body. I'm submitted to the leadership here. You've got to be careful about those relationships. They are handled with great humility and care. Because I tell you, it's easy. I've seen it, and maybe some of you have experienced it as well. I've experienced it where leadership can run roughshod over people, and you cannot have that. I mean, these are God's. This is God's flock. This is God. These are the people that Jesus died for, and that's why it's even more so important that anybody that raises up in the leadership has a heart of humility. And we are here as servants of Jesus Christ to help His people come along in the Lord. And then it says, they are keeping watch over your soul. So that tells me that there's a responsibility of vigilance. We're watching over. Now that watching over isn't like always into people. We're watching over the souls of people. It's not like we're sitting at what, what kind of TV shows are you watching? It's not, it's not that we don't have a checklist. It's like we're watching the souls of people. You know, and Lord, help us be discerning about the souls of the flock. You know, when you start seeing somebody, and you know the soul is like your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you can start, you can almost read it on people's face. Something isn't right here. Have you ever noticed that before? They say that's being vigilant. You see it, something doesn't seem right here. Lord, how can I be used? to go encourage my brother or my sister here. Because so I'm being vigilant, I'm watching over. I'm looking out. You know, and part of, part of what, what, what we're trying to do with you, with this group of people, we say, yeah, God, I want God to use me, and say, hey, let's be those kinds of people. Let's be vigilant. You know, if you see somebody who looks discouraged or you just, you know, whatever, just say, God, give me a heart to recognize, to see, and then... Again, not that you're better than anybody. You're just you're just one of the you're, you're just one of the team that's saying, "Hey, my teammate's suffering. I want to help him grow." If you're playing on a baseball team and you have a guy that's sick over there and he's not playing up to his, up to par, what you you want to do is try to encourage him because if the first baseman's suffering, the whole team's going to suffer. You know, if his, if his eyesight's going haywire and he's seeing double, you don't want him over there playing on second base or first base for a while. You know, it's like, hey, which ball is it? <clears throat> but the whole team will suffer. it will be getting hit after hit after hit, you know, because this guy's hurting. So God wants us to be vigilant, watching out for the souls of one another and helping, helping people to move forward. And then it says, also, they watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Yeah, and, and the thing that you got to remember is people who are in leadership is that you will give an account. We, we will, one day you will stand before the Lord to give an account for the souls of the flock. You have to give an answer because these are the people that God has brought under your care. And what are you doing with them? What have you done with them? And the Bible says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. So, for example, the Lord said... You know, how you doing with Dave? And you go, oh, Dave. See, you don't want that groaning going on. It's a joy. <laughs> Dave, oh, Dave. Could you bring up Dave? Okay, a couple of principles here at the end. Obedience requires a fight. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I just want you to see that obedience is a fight here. 
He talks about casting down imaginations. Anything in our life that exalts itself against the knowledge of God but bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a fight that we'll have till the day we die. You know, we're going to constantly be battling against the things in my own life, my own desires, just like Jesus on the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And we'll always come to those crossroads where I have a certain desire, a certain thing, but I say, Lord, above everything else, I want your will. And we're constantly battling these things, even in our minds today, that says lifting yourself up against God's obedience and saying, oh, Lord, I want to I change that. I want to walk in obedience here. Like when you pick up the phone and you're ready to call your friend to give him the latest gossip, you're going to say, no, Lord. Because the Word of God says not to use my tongue in this manner. And so you, you bring those thoughts to obedience to Christ. And it brings a change in your life. You can be a person who's been a gossip all your life, and because you start walking in obedience, that changes. You can be a bitter person all your life, and when you start walking in obedience to Christ, it changes. You can be an unholy person all your life, and when you start walking in obedience to Christ, it begins to change. We're bringing our things captive to the obedience of Christ. So there's a fight. And, and obedience to Christ is worth fighting for in all of our lives. Obedience requires faith. Abraham, he was called out to go to a place which he should afterward receive an inheritance. He obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he went. That's an amazing story. Abraham, the Lord said, go to a place that I will show you. He didn't give him any more direction than that. The Bible says he just obeyed. He went out not knowing where he went. A lot of us do that, don't we? We go not knowing where we're going. But this was a, this is really the call of God in his life. Amen. And Abraham responded. Sometimes the Lord might call you and ask you to do something. You, say, you may not have the entire picture. He may just say, go to this place. Go over here. Go do this. Go say that. But as we walk in faith... And do and respond to what his what he's saying, what we're hearing, and we walk in obedience to that, then he will carry out the difference. So obedience does require faith. Obedience requires discipline. The Bible says in Psalm one that the, his delight is in the law of the Lord. He on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. So the idea here is that as we spend time in the Word of God, it starts bringing about a productive thing in our life. So We're like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So and that's a discipline. See, delighting in the law of the Lord. In His law, He meditates day and night. And so I want to see a life of obedience. I want to see a life of fruitfulness. It means I need to give myself to the Word of God. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 9, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So there's this idea of discipline, you know, just bringing ourselves around to say, I want to follow the Lord. I want to obey Him. And then finally, obedience requires that we are yoked with Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, He said. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. So Jesus calls us to be a yoke fellow, somebody who puts on the yoke. And a yoke is uh, a commitment to follow, a commitment to stand beside him, a commitment to learn from him. Okay, we're going to take, uh, I guess we're going to end with that point there and maybe take a short break, maybe five minutes, come back and close up with a few things. So let's take a five-minute break. I'm going to stop that, Ted.